Good afternoon, everyone. We just give ourselves 30 seconds. We should be on. As we wait, I want to confirm that our online panelists are there. Dr. Koyabe, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Moses, are you there? Moses by Yingana from African Union Commission. Are you there? Who is there? Uh, you? Yes, I'm connected. Oh, perfect. I'm connected. Thank you, Moses. So good afternoon again, and welcome to the African Union Open Forum 2023. We, we are delighted that you are all able to join us, and considering we have already taken a few minutes, we'll just go into the program. And to start with, uh, I will have uh, Dr. Chidi Diugo, who will be giving us uh, an overview or a highlight of what happened in the Africa IGF that was held in Abuja. And uh, he is the head, New Media and Information Security, Nigeria Communication Commission. Dr. Chidi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. This report refers to the African Internet Governors Forum that was held between the 19th and the 21st of September 2023 in Nigeria. To do my presentation, I prepared an outline that is written as follows. Distinguished guests, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we express our appreciation for the cooperation displayed during the recently concluded African Internet Governance Forum held in Abuja, Nigeria, between the 19th and the 21st September 2023. Now, the details of the forum are as shown on the board. First, the theme of the forum was transforming African digital landscape, empowering inclusion security and innovation, followed by um, the facilitators of the program, which included the government of Nigeria, and specifically the National Assembly, um, through the efforts of the various uh, committees, uh, led by Senator Shuabu Afolabi Salusi, and Honorable Adejiji Stanley Olajide, and the Mi Minister of Communications and Innovations, the Nigerian Communications Commission, and other relevant stakeholders. In general, the forum had an impressive turnout, recording nearly 3,105 participants, and then 700 of those were in person while about 1,600 were virtually participated. Before the forum, there have been various activities leading up to the, to the main um, celebration. Firstly, there was African School of Internet Governance between the 13th and the 18th September 2023. Now, the trust of the school was to build internet governance in Africa, focusing on the African Union data policy framework. Now, this was closely followed by African Parliamentary Symposium. And then the trust for that 
was the contribution of the parliamentarians to shape digital trust on the African continent. Lastly, there was an African Youth Internet Governance Forum on the 18th of September. Now, the trust was basically emerging technologies, leveraging innovation for sustainable development and youth empowerment. There were various sub themes, numbering up to 40, but then the major caps had to do with cybercrime, human rights and freedom, universal access and meaningful connectivity, cybersecurity, digital device and inclusion, artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. So we had very fruitful time in Nigeria, and then very meaningful deliberations we are undertaking. The summary of which I'm presenting as follows. Multi-stakeholder approach is key and required for the AIGF. The need for enabling environment cannot be overemphasized. Enforcement of ex instant cyber laws are very necessary. And the display of political will to shape the digital landscape is required. Not to mention the legislative framework, which in essence will promote ethical, artificial intelligence principles and make inclusivity a data priority. And as need to develop strong foundation of digital identities across the continent. And lastly, the adoption of Pan-African payment and settlement system. These five pillars we are entirely agreed upon by the forum. And now to localize our efforts in Nigeria. The federal government of Nigeria, and just as we believe that so many other, you know, um, countries are doing, is playing a pivotal role of multi-stakeholderism in shaping the trajectory of technological advancement. And in doing so, it has put in place strategic objectives, initiatives, regulatory instruments, and platforms for all stakeholders to come together from time to time to assess where we are, and then to most importantly determine where we're going. And in overall, this ensures inclusivity, security, and innovation. Nigeria, like most countries that we have heard about, has also taken major steps towards the harmonization of rights of way across the 36 states of the Federation, which means that the barrier to entry to play in our industry has been lowered. It also ensures that there's a thorough connectivity and then there's fair competition amongst the players, which also translates to ease of licensing intended operators. And of course, the price regime has been regulated, is open access and non-discriminatory. And finally, all these had contributed to what you might call the universal access and service obligations of the commission. As a continent, our work is just beginning in a very simple way, and we need to continue to work together to make Africa a shining example of digital progress. Together, we will overcome the challenges and seize the opportunities that are emerging in our markets. While countries while some countries have made significant progress, other countries cannot be said to have made similar progress. But across board, we identify some challenges that we must overcome as a continent. And these include inadequate visibility of individual countries' activities, which can create problems in terms of sharing information. While our different countries are working tirelessly to ensure that our digital footprints are all over, it's very important that we come together to share information 
in a way and a manner that will be real time and achievable. We also fear that there's insufficient collaborations within the African region. This second point somehow points to the first one, which means there's need for continuous handshake amongst the various continental stakeholders. It did appear that research and development are inadequate across the federating units. We all know how disruptive the emerging technologies can be, and then the speed with which they are eroding our everyday life, and therefore the need for collaboration for research efforts to be made cannot be overemphasized. What we don't want to do is to continue to dwell in crying about the disruption of the OTTs and the other emerging technologies where, where we can literally seize the opportunity to increase our research capacity and get funded. And lastly, there have been concerns raised about the inadequate platforms for capacity development, especially for the digital grassroots. So, with the appreciation that I rendered at the beginning of this, I would like to conclude by saying that the African Internet Governance Forum held in Abuja in September attracted good participation across the entire Africa. As the host country, we are grateful for all those that attended. And then we are even more grateful to those who took out the time to write to us to express their profound gratitude and to say to us how beautiful our country is. And so, having talked about the prospects that we all stand to benefit, especially in research and collaborations, and then also identify the few challenges. It is very important that as Africans, we'll do what is needed for us to be able to compete effectively in the digital world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chidi, for that elaborate uh, report about the Africa IGF. I'm now going to ask uh, Honorable Sam George just to give key highlights from the Parliamentarian Symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and to the honorable members in the House, our big mommy, Madam Mary, and everyone gathered here. For us as members of parliament, it was a very long IGF because we started with the AFRICIG, um, the African School on Internet Governance, which was not a school, it was a boot camp. Um, <laughs> it was a boot camp that, that really stretched members of parliament. We started at 8 a.m., closed at 8 p.m., and had to submit our assignments by 5 a.m. the following day, uh, thanks to Henriette. Uh, she's not a very big friend of members of parliament. But we put out a very important document uh, from that session that led us into the parliamentary track. And, and what that did for us was to highlight the opportunities that exist for members of parliament to begin to act as the bridges between civil society, technical community, and the executive or government in ensuring that we don't leave anyone behind and we close the digital gap. Part of the key things that we discussed was the role of, and, and highlighted in our parliamentary sessions, was the role that members of parliament have to play in ensuring that we either initiate or support executive government to bring legislation that will help with the implementation of the AU data policy framework. Because for us, we realize that it's important that as a continent, we need to have harmonization of our data policies across the board. Um, and, and, and one of the things that we realized was that data policies do not necessarily end, 
data policies do not necessarily just end with data protection legislation, but also with the necessary harmonization and synchronization. And one of the big, big examples we used was a Nigerian big tech company called Jumia. Jumia Works is a Nigerian company, but works across about 16 African countries, including Ghana. So if we do not have proper data flows across African continent, across the African continent, we're going to have challenges. So the issues of data sovereignty and data, cross-border data flows came up highly, and how as members of parliament, we need to ensure that even as we look at protecting critical and sensitive national data under the precepts of data sovereignty, we also need to realize that we are increasingly connected and that we cannot survive on our own without cross-border data flows. Another key thing that we also looked at was the need for us to prioritize funding, funding for digital infrastructure. Digital public infrastructure is a, is a very key thing that we need to look at in our countries. And, and that's a key thing that the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance is looking to do in terms of the budgeting cycle that's going to happen in our various countries at in, uh, when parliaments resume uh, come the next few weeks. Most parliaments are resuming in about a week or two, and so we're looking to see how well we can, we can improve the funding that goes to digital public infrastructure because you cannot talk about data flows and cross border and data sovereignty and, and, and the free flow of data if you don't have the infrastructure in your country in the first place to house the data that houses it in a secure manner. Another key thing we discussed was the issue of that fine line between state security and digital rights of citizens. We recognize as members of parliament that the state has a responsibility to protect citizens from both state and non-state actors who are online. However, the state must do so in a manner that does not infringe on the digital rights of citizens. And so these are some of the things that as members of parliament we, we left Abuja with, and we're very confident that as a network of, of members of parliament, we can pat ourselves on the back that most times they say MPs don't sit in a room for very long, but we proved to the tech community and civil society that you've got MPs on the African continent who are passionate about internet governance. In fact, more passionate about internet governance than the tech community themselves. <laughs> and, and you've got champions. You've got champions for you. But one of the big key takeaways, which I would end on, if you leave me as a politician, we'll talk beyond uh, uh, till tomorrow. One of the key takeaways we, we left Abuja with was the fact that civil society and technical community need to look at working closer with members of parliament to build their capacity. Because if you don't help build the capacity of members of parliament, you can only push legislation based on how deep your knowledge of a subject is. And so if civil society does not engage with parliamentary portfolio committees and members on those committees, and if we even do a sample here, many people from civil society here and ask you, them to mention five members of the portfolio committees and their national parliaments, many of them cannot. If you don't build relationships with these members of these portfolio committees, you can only continue to cry outside, but you won't have the, the, the change that you want to see. And it was refreshing for us that we had members of parliament like uh, Honorable Stanley Adedeji from the Nigerian House of Reps and the chairman of the Senate Committee. Uh, we're told Nigerian senators don't like to sit in meetings, but I mean, they've shown us that they have first competence and secondly, they're willing to work if they are engaged. So civil society, you have champions of internet governance in parliamentarians, work with us to get what you need from government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Sam, for those insights. And we challenge you next year, same time we want to see what has been done <laughs> in those areas. Now I give the floor to Mariam Jobe to give highlights of what happened in the youth session. Thanks. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mariam Job, as she already introduced, and I'll just highlight some of the key takeaways that we had from the Africa Youth Internet Governance Forum held a day before the main Africa IGF, and uh, it brought together very a very diverse set of new voices in the youth perspective, and you know we addressed 
critical issues related to internet governance, youth empowerment, and emerging technology. And uh, we highly emphasize the pivotal role that young people play in shaping digital future and their importance in their policy development and enforcement in this regard. Uh, we urge everyone, you know, policymakers, relevant stakeholders, including the members of parliament, civil society, and government, irrespective of their positions, honestly, to advocate for changes in the digital landscape. We also address a very concerning issue, which is the lack of knowledge among young people about issues around internet governance, particularly cybersecurity laws, data privacy, uh, digital inclusion, and uh, you know, continuous outreach efforts to educate and empower youth who are uh, unaware of internet governance issues and how it affects them in their daily lives and their daily usage of the internet. And participants call for initiatives to integrate internet governance and technology into the education system in our various African countries and especially the underdeserved, underserved communities and the rural, the rural communities. We also highlighted the importance of improving internet access and digital literacy from the grassroots level. Um, Another key highlight that was made during the session was that we delved into discussions around artificial intelligence and the need for safe spaces to report problems and uh, cases that are cyber crimes, for instance, and the importance of ethical frameworks that are tailored to the African context and uh, the lack of comprehensive data laws in the in the in some countries. I know that Nigeria has you know made a progress in that, but there are some countries, many African countries, that still lack comprehensive data laws that are that require a lot of attention. And uh, we also you know concluded the concluded the event with an intergenerational session between the youth and the MPs, where we had an open dialogue where we talked with the MPs. The MPs heard what the youth want, what they want, what we want them to consider. And uh, we, we talked about how they can support the youth and their visions. While specifics were not fully detailed, you know, we talked about fostering collaboration between the youth and the government. And representatives emerged as a crucial step in addressing digital challenges. Um, in, in conclusion, overall, I think uh, we talked most, the key highlights was that uh, we need to have increased education and awareness, inclusivity, ethical considerations, and uh, citizen participation in order to build a sustainable digital future for Africa. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Maria, that we need collaboration, we need innovative views of uh, engaging our youths, and we need to ensure that we are all holistically moving together in capacity building, safety online, and the like, so we all have to work together. Now, my next speaker is online, uh, Mr. Moses Biangana, the Acting Head, Information Society Division, African Union Commission. Moses, can you take the floor? Yeah, thank you, Mambula. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the African Union Commission, I welcome you all to this of the AU Open Forum. Let me out this opportunity to thank the government of Nigeria and the African IDA for the successful organization of 23 edition in Abuja, Nigeria. Our leaders have recognized digital transformation as a driver for social development and critical to the attainment of Agenda 2063 and UN Sustainable Development Goals, adopting the digital transformation for Africa as a master plan that will guide our digital agenda up to 2030. Across Africa, the digital economy is on the rise. In the past year, its contribution to GDP has doubled in many African United States from 1.5% to more than 3%. While there's been progress, there is still a lot to be done. Connectivity courage, connectivity courage has usage 
is low. And Africa's rate for cyber crime remains low, making it a prime target for cyber At the continental level, the Asia has made in the environment to facilitate implementing partners across the continent, build on these continental strategies and frameworks to accelerate Africa's digital transformation. These strategies and frameworks will all facilitate harmonization across the continent. These include development and adoption of the digital strategy for Africa that sets out a vision to build an inclusive digital society and economy in Africa. Sectoral digital strategies in the critical sectors of education, agriculture, health, and e-commerce have also been developed to facilitate scale up access to smart digital technologies and associated data-driven services across all sectors. Furthermore, the AU data policy framework has been adopted to facilitate all data across sectors and borders where the interoperability framework for digital use has also been adopted to facilitate a statement of digital editions that are inclusive, trusted, and interoperable. The, EU, the African Union has also developed a draft on and empowerment policy and conducted a study on the cyber security in Africa, part of the process to develop a continental cyber security strategy. I am pleased to inform you that 16 AU members by the AU Commission on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection which anchored its entry in court. This item gives impetus to our endeavors to promote cyber security while advancing education. With regards to internet governance, through the first phase of FIDA, support has been extended to the organization of the internet governance forums at national, regional, and levels. And together with the European Union, we are working on the second phase of the exam. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, moving forward, the continent's useful population structure is a demographic dividend that could be a game changer in accelerating access to digital production and boost so economic development, create jobs and improve lives. Recent statistics show that 60% of Africa's population is below 25 years old. By 2050, Africa's population is expected to grow to 2.5 billion people. And these will understand and a third of the world's youth will be uh, in Africa. Africa's youth are there for an opportunity to drive Africa's digital economy. Hence, the need to invest in their skill development to relate innovation to growth on the, con on the continent. In conclusion, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to the organization of this forum, the AU Open Forum, and invite all stakeholders to work together to bridge the agro digital divide, have the Indaga close, and secure Africa's digital. Thank you, Moses, for those insightful highlights. 
And for the document that Moses mentioned, they are in the AUC websites, and we can consult them. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Makta Sek. He's the Chief of Section Innovation and Technology, United Nations Economic Commission of Africa. Dr. Sek, can you take the floor? Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning where you are. I think we have some people connected online and it's still morning there. Just uh, at the beginning, I would like to thank you all of you to attend this uh, open forum organized by African Union. And also would like to thank you the government of, uh, federal government of Nigeria for the successful organization for the African Internet Governance Forum. In the first presentation, the, 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 the two first presentations, they highlight the key funding of uh, this uh, very interesting uh, forum organized in Africa. But let me try to highlight the outcome on the work uh, we are doing now at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. As you know, one of uh, our key mission is to support African development. And when we support African development, it's not only focused on digital technology. We focus on several areas, macro, microeconomy, climate change, education, health sector, as well as statistic and as a sector. And we try in our sector, in digital technology, how we can leverage all this sector through digital technology. Why is it is very important to, to listen to the presentation done by the government of, uh, of uh, Nigeria and uh, Miss Job on the recommendation of this African Internet Governance Forum. Let me start on the first point. As you know, there is a deficit uh, of co connectivity in Africa. We have 60% uh, of our population offline. And this, this is due or several uh, uh, problems. The first one, it is the infrastructure. We talk about, uh, the Honorable talk about this uh, digital public infrastructure. We have a deficit of $100 billion to build the African infrastructure uh, to provide broadband to everybody by 2030. We need to, 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 to make sure all people will be connected by 2030. And for this, we need to involve the private sector and also have a uh, sound regulation to attract investment in the development of the infrastructure in the continent. This means also we have a uh, work with the, our regulator to look at the way we regulate now the, the new system because we, if there is a, an advance of digital technology around the world. Second, the continent, the digital divide, the, I'm going to focus only on the gender digital divide. As you know, we have 45% uh, of our men connected compared to 34%. It is a gap of 11%. And it is very important to involve the women and youth in the digital technology sector. Why? Because excluding women from the digital sector costs the, as cost for the middle and uh, middle income country um, um, around one trillion dollar in, in 2020. And by 2025, it will be 1.5 trillion, uh, trillion dollar. It is something very important if you want to take benefits of this digital technology. Because we have a several study uh, to uh, highlight estimated the cost of the internet market in Africa will be $180 million in 2025. But without involvement, this uh, girl and woman, we can't reach this uh, amount. It is important to, to put in place uh, activity and, and policy to make sure we get all people included in this uh, digital er era. S third point, it, we, we talk a lot of about cybersecurity. As you know, cybersecurity is a very important. We can't use this uh, digital space without securing all our data, all our citizens. Uh, African Union has a, pro, has a, has, has a rule on cybersecurity. ECA has developed a guideline on cybersecurity. We have all to work together to make sure uh, our continent is secure. And the cybersecurity 
remain a big challenge because it costs now 10% of our GDP. We have 10% of African GDP. How many schools you can build? How many hospitals you, you, can, you, can, you can build? How many people can be uh, moved from this poverty? And we need to, to, to look at, to have a very careful, uh, very careful initiative to, to, to fight this cyber security, as well as we have this issue of cyber terrorism using the cyber security uh, to, to kill people is, is something very uh, key in this continent. Sec fourth point, it is the issue of uh, uh, people offline. Yeah, We have uh, uh, 500 million people in the continent without any legal form of identity. These people doesn't exist anywhere. And we can't do any planification with this, without these people. We need to take into consider consideration the issue of digital ID, to provide digital ID to all, to see how we can ent interoperable our system. Since uh, it, CRVS uh, system, digital ID system, health system, uh, license ID system, passport system, we need to work on this uh, digital ID to make sure these people have an identity and can participate to this uh, digital information. Let, last but not least, it is uh, emer this emerging technology. Um, I will focus only on this uh, artificial intelligence. It is a big opportunity, but we need to, to be very careful. We need to build the capacity of our youth generation. How we build the capacity, why we are building the capacity of our new generation? Because we have uh, this demographic dividend. By 2050, 70% of our population will be under, t under 35 years. If you want to, would like to participate in this uh, digital F era, we need to build their capacity to be ready to participate to this four industrial revolution. And also, we need also to look at the regulation of this artificial intelligence. Because otherwise, we can miss, out some, sec miss some sector. Uh, the, the industrial, the, the cultural sector, as well as uh, the, the, the uh, sector on uh, reading booking or developing booking, we have to look at uh, this uh, sector carefully with this artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence can offer a op lot of opportunity, be, but we have uh, also a lot of challenge f f with this uh, artificial intelligence. We, we need to uh, look at this uh, carefully. And why we, we, what we do in ECA to overcome on all this challenge and to support African country. I'm, I'm going to highlight uh, some of our key activity. In 2018, we have uh, set up uh, a center of excellence on digital ID, digital threat, and digital economy to support African country to use to native digital technology for their sustainable development. And now we are supporting African country to implement the African digital transformation strategy developed by African Union in collaboration with uh, UNECA and as a partner. And this uh, strategy, it is a blueprint for Africa digital sector from 2020 to 2030. Now, a uh, lot of countries have been benefited from uh, the support of ECA. On uh, cyber security, we organized, we organized uh, two years ago the first African summit in cyber security in uh, Togo. One of outcome of the cybersecurity summit was the declaration of Lomé. And since the declaration of Lomé, we have seen a lot of progress. Now we have 15 countries who ratify this African Union Convention on Cybersecurity, called Malabo Convention. And also we are established now a center of uh, cybersecurity in uh, Togo. On uh, digital ID also, we, we are supporting a lot of countries uh, to develop their digital ID program. It is, uh, we can uh, give an example of uh, Nigeria uh, in the region of uh, Kaduna, Kaduna region, Gambia, and as a country also benefits from this uh, support on uh, digital ID. As, as uh, on capacity building, we talk about we need to build the capacity of the young generation, why we, we already established a center, African center on uh, artificial intelligence in uh, to in uh, Congo, Congo Brazzaville, this center is uh, functional since uh, last year, and uh, last week, it was this week, they have their academic, uh, uh, I think, uh, for 2023 starting with uh, several uh, engineers on artificial intelligence, cyber security. It is something I think we can build to be more uh, 
relevant and more performant in the sector of artificial intelligence, uh, applicable to the sector of health, uh, environment, climate change, and industry and ec economy. Another point also, we, we, we support African country, it is uh, to promote the youth generation. We have several initiatives for youth generation. One, it is a STI forum we are going to organize. We organize every year and uh, to have a lot of uh, young, young innovators to, to promote some innovation idea in the continent. We have also this uh, uh, famous program for, for girl, African girl coding cam camp and uh, focus on the girl aged from 12 to 25 years. And we provide them skills in several areas, artificial intelligence, web gaming, uh, uh, and now the program uh, has trained around 35,000 girls across the continent. Another issue also for the parliamentary also, we have a program for the parliamentary, an important program focused to build the capacity of the parliamentary and the, on the making decision also. It is very important for them to understand the issue of this digital technology because at the end, is them to, 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 uh, to adopt the rule and the regulation for, for the digital technology. And this uh, training focus also on fintech. We have uh, one program with Alibaba, and also in cybersecurity with uh, the Global Forum of uh, Cybersecurity Expert. And we need also to promote the voice of Africa. Why we have uh, several forum? The one forum led several UN-led forum. One, it is a wishes outcome for Africa, World Summit Information Society. Forum for Africa will organize every year in, uh, in Africa and to focus on the 11 action line of uh, the WISIS to see the progress made by African country in the implementation of this uh, 11 action line going to the role of the government, the cyber security development infrastructure, e-service, uh, and as an as, as activity. And also, we support the organization of the African Internet Governance Forum every year. And now we are focused on this global digital compact. I'm going to stay uh, to focus one minute before I conclude on this global digital compact, uh, because it is it will be the one of the key framework for the Af for the world, and we need uh, African participation in this global <laughs> digital compact. How we can participate is not just uh, to attend the meeting. Now we are in the consultation period. And we need to provide input. I think all sectors we discuss, uh, we can provide input uh, based on the need of Africa. We talk about this digital public infrastructure, this access aff affordability. We talk about capacity building, emerging technology, internet fragmentation, public good. All, I think, uh, everybody can have something to, to provide. And this uh, global digital compact is open to everyone. F private sector, government, civil society, academia, everybody will should be involved because this global digital uh, compact will define the future we want on the development of technology for the world. And we need Africa to be part. Why I, I call upon all stakeholders, all participants here to, be, uh, to provide your input in this uh, global digital compact. We already have one African input developed at the meeting organized by ECA in July 2023 in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And the, 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 the document is uh, available on our website, but you, you can still provide your, your input before final sub submission. It is very important for everybody to take into consideration the importance of the global and digital compact and to think about also on the WCIS plus 20. We are going to organize the WCIS plus 20. We start the, the reflection to organize the WCIS plus 20 in, uh, in uh, we, we will organize in uh, November, November, early in December in uh, Victoria Falls for Africa. And we need to discuss to by 2025 20, uh, to come up with a solid proposal of Africa, a robust proposal for Africa for the continuation of WCS uh, beyond to 2025, and to look at also what is a, the positionment of uh, WCS IGF vis-a-vis uh, -vis of the Global Digital Compact. I think it is something I would like to highlight for, uh, to share with you, and uh, thank you very much for involving ECA 
on this important uh, forum. And we invite you also to attend uh, several side events. Uh, we, we, we start organizing since uh, Saturday, but we have uh, some side event uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow. And I would like to invite you all of you, uh, all of you to, to attend this side event. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sek, for reminding us that we need to focus on women among the many things you have said. And for us to contextualize the issue, we need to, to analyze and get the opportunity cost of this digital exclusion. It's something we have discussed for many years, but we need to be intentional and innovative to be able to address this issue. And this can only be supported if we have the facts and statistics and we are able to, again, link it with the livelihoods opportunities. My next speaker is online as well. That is uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe, Senior Manager, African Union Global for, uh, Forum on Cybersecurity Project. And uh, Dr. Martin, can you take the floor? Uh, first of all, uh, I hope you can hear me. And first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and also for giving the GFCE uh, an opportunity to share some of the uh, aspects of this uh, intervention. Secondly, I want also to uh, pay tribute to the speakers who have just come before me uh, in some of the issues that they've articulated going forward. Uh, as said before, uh, my name is Martin Koyabe. I actually lead and also coordinate the activities between the AU and the GFCE. Some of the issues that I'll highlight on uh, have also been uh, contributed by our partners, and that is the AU Development Agency, that's our Neppard, uh, and also colleagues within the GFCE ecosystem. Uh, if you allow me, let me just give you the context of what we've been doing with the AU, and this refers to the AU GFCE collaboration project. Uh, this project uh, has actually come to an end, and we are now moving to the next phase of this particular project, uh, where we were looking at how do we build resilience and ensure that uh, African countries have the capacity to uh, sustain uh, what we call cyber capacity building within the continent. There were three areas that we looked at, and these areas were very, very pertinent. Uh, one was the issue around taking an assessment to really look carefully and look at what are the priorities of African countries when it comes to issues of cyber. Remember, COVID uh, really interfered with many of the plans of many of the African countries, and therefore there was a shift from what we call the areas where they had planned, for example, in the digital infrastructure and other areas which actually saw a massive investment since there was a need, and also with other ministries such as health, uh, which saw a massive increase in terms of funding. So therefore, the priorities of African countries really shifted uh, along the, the, you know, the path. The other aspect was to look at how do you sustain capacity building within the continent? And as said earlier, it is true that by 2050, the continent will have roughly about 2.5 billion people, and out of that, two, actually a good chunk will be young people. So therefore, there was a need to make sure that there was an investment in, especially in looking at the expertise that exists within the continent. So therefore, the issues around uh, sustain that sustainability through the resources, especially the expertise that exists was very critical. And then thirdly, was the issue around institutional memory. How do we make sure that we establish the issues around knowledge so that we can be able to have uh, many institutions, citizens, and also participants to be able to learn about cyber in future. So therefore the development of what we call knowledge modules was very critical. So these are what we call best practice or what we call good practice type of uh, platforms that enable uh, people who are in cyber to either learn uh, about experiences in different parts of the continent, but more importantly, to be able to share their expertise and also new ideas on specific areas. Uh, when it comes to the areas of interventions and also the lessons learned, Madam Chair, if you allow me, I'll just go very briefly, very quickly. There were several areas that came up and several interventions that we saw. 
it is important that the area of uh, especially the need to sustain and to be able to protect the infrastructure became very, very, very high in the priorities of many countries. So therefore, establishment of SATs, enhancement of CSATs and SATs became very, very uh, high in the agenda of many of the African countries. And in this aspect, it was an issue around how do you ensure that we actually uh, beef up the capacities of CERTs in many of the African countries, because some of the people who get trained move on to other jobs, and therefore many African countries struggle to maintain the capacity, to maintain the skill sets that are required. So therefore, uh, an issue around CERTs and the critical national infrastructure was very high in the, in the, in the agenda. Some of the areas that were, were proposed as the way forward is to ensure that we have what we call uh, an identification of critical uh, you know, infrastructures in these countries. These countries require that people or rather the, the institutions or the agencies to identify what is critical. It's also important to conduct what we call the risk assessments of the critical infrastructure so that we know how much investment we need in those particular areas. But other, and, and, and more importantly, it was to develop what we call a critical infrastructure protection framework so that countries can understand what they need to do going forward in terms of protection of the critical infrastructure. And this was also exacerbated by the fact that many countries depend on the digital infrastructure for most of the services that we see today. And that's why that was very, very critical. The second intervention was the issue around development of skills. And I really support some of the sentiments that have been expressed by my previous speakers or the previous speakers on the need to actually beef up the skill sets and capacity. The GFCE, uh, through the project, actually with the AU, has established what we call the Africa Cyber Experts Community. This is a community that comprises of over 80 experts, and some of them, I can see them in the room, uh, they're from roughly about over 37 countries in the continent, and we continue from growing from strength to strength in order to establish what we call the southern to southern expertise, which can actually be able to help many of the countries to be able to converge and be able to uh, address some of the issues that they have. So, for example, if you have an expert who is good in certs in Malawi, and the country that probably requires that expertise in, is in North Africa. Surely there's, a, there's no need of going to the North to seek such an expert. Therefore, if we have experts within the continent that can be established and, and known for their, for their de development, it makes a lot of sense to build that particular capacity in order to support future need in those particular areas of need, especially when it comes to cyber capacity building. So therefore, the development of skills is important. There's a need to provide the opportunities, especially for individuals in marginalized areas. I think this is something that came out within the project and also strengthening cyber diplomacy and the understanding of normity and that process. And this is something that we've discussed in detail. There is a need for African countries to understand what is the process for being involved in the discussion of cyber diplomacy? What are the tenets of the understanding of the basics that are required within this area? And then thirdly, there's a need to, to, to also promote what we call diversity and inclusivity. And I like the presentation that was given earlier by the, 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 the member of parliament and also by the Nigerian minister to make sure that we can build this diversity. And these are sentiments that were expressed at the IGF Africa, for those of us who were there, that we need to make sure that all communities, especially the diverse communities, are built within this. So therefore, we need to encourage the need for the young people and both old and other people who are actually vulnerable within the community to be able to be involved in these areas. Within the GFCE and in the collaboration project, we've established the network of African women in cyber. This network has grown from strength to strength. Thank you, Coach, Madam, Madam Chair, since you are the co-founder for this particular organization, to have moved it from where it is to the next level. And I think that is one area where we've seen a lot of uh, effort being put in and we would urge that more effort is put in, as Magda said, 
that when you have more than 50% of the population is women, then it's obvious that we need to have women and girls in cyber, as, you know, taking their role and being able to support the efforts. As I come to wind up, there were areas of concern, especially when it comes to resources and funding. And this is something that is not new. Many of the projects that we've seen in the continent do not necessarily have what we call the sustainment built into those particular projects. So therefore, after the funding is over, these projects normally either end or these projects are never sustained to the level that is expected. There is a need for the African countries to also invest more in terms of funding. So therefore, when you develop cybersecurity strategies or when you develop these particular interventions, it's important to factor in how these countries can be able to sustain some of these particular projects. We know there are some good examples in the continent of countries that have been able to sustain their certs or they've been able to sustain specific projects internally without necessarily seeking external funding. So therefore, in terms of budget, uh, budgeting, especially for parliamentarians and other decision makers who are in the room, it's important that we think about funding as a critical component when it comes to issues of cyber capacity building. And then finally, Madam, Madam Chair, the issue around the political will cannot be emphasized any further. And I really want to emphasize what uh, the representative from parliament from Ghana just said just a few, a few minutes ago, that the political will is important. And the reason why this is important is because many of the political leaders, many of the legislators do make decisions that affect you and I, especially when it comes to the continent. So therefore, the issue around sensitizing the executive, sensitizing members of parliament, sensitizing people who make decisions that might not necessarily uh, be, 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 you know, be decisions that can actually have an impact now, but might have an impact in the future, it's very important that we really sensitize those levels or those echelons uh, in the society so that they can understand what are the critical issues when it comes to cyber. As I finalize, Madam Chair, there are some interventions that the GFCE continues to make. And we really want to thank some of the partners that are in the room that we've worked together. I know we've been able to actually uh, support some of the IGF regional capacity development, especially when it comes to issues of the School on Internet Governance and other areas. We've also been able to work in tandem with some of the organizations in order to push specific areas of cyber capacity building forward. Uh, in summary, and as I come to a conclusion, Madam Chair, Sorry. I just want to... Sorry, Dr. Koyabe, you only have 30 seconds. Okay, so the last bit here is the <laughs> upcoming <laughs> meeting that is coming up in uh, Ghana, and I know um, many of you are looking forward to it. There will be, for the first time, we shall have the cyber security experts and cyber capacity building development partners coming together in Ghana on the 29th to the 30th of November to talk about Mission Cyber. But thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Koyabem. We are now going to the Q&A session. And I want to ask all the participants, if you ask a question, uh, please state who should answer the question so that we are able to align ourselves. We have about uh, 15 minutes for that. Kindly only one question per person, and don't make it as if it's another presentation so that we save on time. And to start with, I'll ask uh, Dr. Shidi next to me to start. Yes, um, it's actually a question. Thank you, Dr. Martins Koyabe, for your beautiful and uh, intelligent presentation. Okay, we talked about uh, critical resources or infrastructure that are required to undertake all the massive projects that you mentioned. But um, for us as regulators in Nigeria, we've received inquiries from a good number of um, stakeholders which had to do with AFRINIC, the uh, in internet and uh, re registry in, uh, in Africa, to which we have not been able to give uh, uh, substantive answer to. And in all your presentation, I have not heard you mention the crisis or the problem or the dysfunctionality within the AFRINIC. The reason being that to sustain the internet and to fight cyber security, it is very important 
that the continent takes charge of the commodity, their bandwidth, which is the IP networks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chidi. We'll take two, three more questions before the panelists start answering them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jameson Olufu, uh, Nigeria, Africa, Nigeria. Uh, I would like to really use opportunity to commend uh, AU and UNECA for starting African IGF 2011. Yeah, I was in the room that day and it was quite tough. But the dividend is for us to see today. And also to appreciate uh, NCC for the excellent toasting of the last uh, African IGF. And to actually say that Nigeria is ripe to host the global IGF. Uh, do you agree? <laughs> yes. 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 So now to the question. Uh, Dr. Makta provided the, that data, which we know that we are really behind the global average with regard to internet uh, penetration. Uh, I want to ask, how about the use of TV white spaces? Are we trying to license that spectrum? Can we use that to really uh, reach the undersell? The tools, the technical know-how is available. Uh, people, I hear people say we don't have the capability, technical capability, we have the cap technical capability we can deploy a lot of infrastructural tools. But my company, we build data centers. We have many that do a lot of things. So digital white spaces from the digital dividend is just there for us to use. With a bandwidth of 100 megabit per second, we can reach the underserved. So what is holding us? Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? As we wait for more questions, I give the floor to Dr. Koyabe to answer the first question and Dr. Maxek for the second one. Uh, th th thank you very much. I don't know whether I'm on the chopping board here, but uh, let me try and uh, be very, very, very careful in how I respond to this issue of happening. But more importantly, I think we all agree that the continent requires consistency it requires organizations that can be able to deliver in some of these aspects that we are discussing if we are to make a difference. Uh, it's very, very unfortunate, especially from what I understand, and I want to be very, very careful here on the situation around Africa, because I think the, the challenge has been the litigation that has been launched uh, in terms of the challenge of the problem that Africa has. I really don't want to go into the details of that because I know it's in the public domain. And if you allow me, uh, Honorable, um, I would like to make sure that we, we really uh, assist where we can to make sure that the organization comes back to what it's meant to be because the continent requires that organization. But more importantly, let's build some, uh, what we call sustainment in terms of how these organizations can function in future so that we know how we build mechanisms for auditing, mechanisms that can be able to create what we call um, an authentic organization that can be able to serve the people and the, and the continent. So for now, I'll want to reserve my extended comments, if you allow, but to let what we call the process take its due course as Afrinic tries to unsolve its issues, as we, know, as we all know it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ma. Uh, Martin, I think we, I'm going to start with, with the Afrinic uh, uh, problem. I, it is a big issue for the continent now. We have seen uh, in the two days ago the resolution of the court. And we need to take seriously into consideration this resolution. Now we, we can't say anything more, but uh, we are going to call a meeting between AUC ECA and Smart Africa to see how we can do to sort it out with this problem. Because when you talk about this digital transformation, uh, uh, job creation, fintech opportunity, e-commerce, if you don't have your IP address, what are, what are you going to do? Hmm? 
nothing. Hmm? Yeah, it is a problem. And for the CCTL, CCTL also pose problem in several African countries. Hmm? There is no this sovereignty, this digital sovereignty in several continents. Hmm? We have our young generation, digital dividends, 70% of youth to represent 42% of the youth in the world. But uh, if you don't have the access, if you don't control your network, anything will happen. It is something we have to take into consideration. Second, regulation. Yeah, it is a big problem. It's, it's not something easy now. Before it was easy when you have only the telecommunication sector, we have the, this uh, mobile uh, and some uh, added value service, it was easy to regulate. But now you have this artificial intelligence. We don't know where we are going with this artificial intelligence. It's very clear. Even for the developed, all, all the world, they doesn't know where we are going with this artificial intelligence. You want to write a book? Just so you ask a GPT, chat GPT to write for you the book. He can write. Yeah, yeah. what is the problem? <laughs> Everything you can do, you can ask this artificial intelligence. It is something like, uh, what call it in French, uh, la vache folle. La, la, la vache folle, mm, because this, uh, <laughs> this cow, it has a cow. <laughs> but now artificial intelligence uses the data from all network and they use all the data of the artificial intelligence, of the service provided by artificial intelligence. We, do, we don't need what happened now. Yeah. We are not safe in this. Uh, and also, when you talk about the services, artificial intelligence, the issue is the cyber security. Now, when you, when you use this uh, cryptography, all this uh, software eh, eh, uh, to save your, your network, hmm? the issue is you are, you are this, uh, this quantum computer now. Hmm? 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 You can't block anything with this. Eh? It's clear. Yeah, if you, they can find any code you, you put in your system. And with this artificial intelligence, it will continue. We need to, to, to work uh, closely Why we have uh, this... Uh, a working group uh, AUC on artificial intelligence to see how what we can do in Africa, what kind of framework we put in, we can put in place, what kind of measure we can put in place to take benefits of uh, this artificial intelligence. Even for the spectrum, it is very important uh, to look at the issue of of spectrum with the development of the 5G. Uh, maybe later 6G will come. And uh, we are not ready for 5G. It's clear. We are not ready. The, because some people use this, uh, what call is this, uh, in, in, is 4G. They, in, they increase the, the 4G to make sure, to make it is uh, like 5G. It's not 5G. Yeah. yeah. It is generally what the several operators did. We have uh, to see this allocation of this bandwidth, hmm? also this spec spectrum. Regulator now has a big role to play, and it is important also all regulators to, to start to building their capacity on this emerging technology. We have artificial intelligence, we have this blockchain, we have all uh, this internet of thing. Tomorrow, nanotechnology will be there. We have this uh, quantum computer. We, we don't know what's happening in the in the world. Yeah, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Sek. We are still going to have more questions. Thank you, madam. Um, my name is Katya Sarajeva. I come from Spider at Stockholm University, just to position my comment. And I would slightly disagree with the previous speaker, just a comment, do not get distracted by AI or blockchain. Um, Spider has been working for seven years with um, telecom regulators in Africa and the solution to a lot of what you're talking about is in regulation. It is still spectrum, it is still um, infrastructure sharing, and all of these things are done by African engineers, economists, and software engineers that are locally in Africa and are constantly working on this. It is complicated and it is hard, but everybody's doing it. So please remember your regulators and also your judiciary because everything rests on the rule of law, so it's not 
um, AI. It's, it's a lot of interesting work and good work that's do it being done on national level, but also in regional harmonization and working together on the basic stuff. Everybody's talking about AI and how blingy it is. It's, it's just a dream. A lot of the work and a lot of the progress is being done is done right now by really highly skilled experts on the African continent and by supporting those people who are working on the bolts and nuts that are not glamorous, that is the everyday work of the telecom regulators, you are actually spreading both connectivity and use and empowering a lot of people as we speak. And a lot of it is done in meetings like this, just everybody's struggling. It's not just Africa. In Sweden, the north of Sweden didn't get connectivity on their own. It's the people who had to make it happen. So the problems are everywhere and Africa is no different and you're doing really good because I work with these people. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I will give uh, Honorable Stanley then two more questions and answers and the finalize. Okay. Probably to save on time, can you kindly just stand behind the mics because we have them? That one may have a challenge. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, permit me to stand on existing protocol. I am Honorable Adedeji Stanley Olajide, um, House Committee Chairman for ICT and Cybersecurity, also representative Nigeria. I think we've been having, I'll cite an example. When we started this whole world of human genomics, where we have to do a lot of analytics around DNA for precision medicine. A lot of doctors were agitating, will this thing take away medical doctor's role? What is it gonna do? Is computer simulation or analytics gonna take away all of our jobs? It is not true. I've been around technology for almost 40 years. I want to say this, let's not get distracted with what, AI is just another technology, as far as I'm concerned. I'm a technologist, and now a lawmaker. Let's not get distracted. Let's focus and keep our eye on the ball. And the ball is how we're going to make this integrated into the future. Is that how we take it and run with it? or you just keep running and we'll be behind. So um, as legislators in the House, let's not get distracted. This, we will skin this cat. There's so many ways we're gonna skin this cat. We are, going, we are going to unravel it. It's just the reality. But the question now is, how quickly are we going to train ourselves to catch up with the rest of the world? Let me stop right there, thank you. Thank you. I give you the floor. I give Onika and then the last one. Yes. <laughs> My name is Shoeba Falabi Salis. I'm a senator from Nigeria and the chairman of Nigerian Study Committee on ICT and Cyber Security. I have three interventions, and I'm gonna do it in two minutes. One is at national level, one is at continental level, and at one is at global level. On the national level, we were in Abuja, and a very beautiful report that had been presented by Dr. Chidi, complimented by Honorable Sam and Mariam. The first thing I believe we need to do as legislators and participants, when we go back, let's put this together as a report and share it with the leadership of each respective national assembly. Otherwise, this report will be circulating amongst us. No one else will know that a wonderful job took place in Abuja and has been complimented at TGM. Don't let us talk this, turn this participation into a holiday or a jamboree. The only way we can get meaningful things out of this, in my view, let's put this report together, 
let Nigerian Senator share with the President of Nigerian Senate, let the Ghanaian parliamentarian do so with the Ghanaian parliamentarians, let us also do so with the representative of various countries in interparliamentary unions like ECOWAS Parliament and African Union. That's one way to ensure that what we are discussing here gets traction among others. That's number one. Number two, I listened to a number of initiatives being done at global level, at continental level. The truth of the matter is that I am hearing some of them for the first time. You cannot be a champion or an advocate of something you are not aware of. Can we have a directory of ongoing initiatives at the continental level to be shared by all parliamentarians? That is the only way you can mainstream it into your national agenda. Mm -hmm. If there's something that has taken place in Malawi that needed to be uh, dom domesticated, it cannot happen until the parliamentarians are aware of it. And it will not be aware of it unless we have a director of it. So the gentleman who spoke, spoke about from the CE. GFC. Yeah, he spoke about some initiative going on. The man from, uh, uh, he says, spoke about something going on. Do we have a directory of saying these are the ongoing initiatives at African level, at African union level, and let's share with the parliamentarians and let us become the evangelists and champions in our various countries. The last one, the last one, we must be grateful to international development partners. GIZ is here, a number of them are here. They have been supportive of initiative in Africa, but that's a, that's a caveat. Sometimes those supports do not address our priorities. Those support come in a generic manner. Malawi requires support for education. That will become a template for the rest of Africa. I want to beg of you, let each country determine its own priorities. And let us approach those development partners with our priorities. Let the funding, let the support be tailored to the priorities of each country. That's where we make the maximum of it. And lastly, I thank you for coming to Nigeria. We are open again. <laughs> thank you for the... Thank you for the comments. We have Onika Denzanya. Good evening, uh, Onika Makwakwa. I am uh, asking a question more specifically around a concern of what is the vision and the strategic plan for growing Africa IGF. I think it's really troubling that we've got about 54 nations and less than 20, if I'm not mistaken, that are actually active and hosting IGF. If we have a vision of hosting more global IGFs in Africa, in Nigeria or wherever, it's going to take us actually showing up en masse and holding each other accountable. I think what, what's been missing uh, with IGF is an accountability framework amongst the multi-stakeholders that are involved, but also amongst us as countries within uh, the continent. So I, I'd like either ECA or AU to speak to what is the vision and the strategic plan for growing and strengthening IGF within the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Onika. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and evening, morning to everyone around the world. My name is uh, Zanyu Ntatisi Asare, CEO of Digitally Legal. Um, and uh, uh, standing on existing protocols, and also I think the questions and comments that were um, uh, articulated, I'm really excited to hear that. But mine is more around, you know, there are a lot of statistics given today and a lot of vulnerable groups that were mentioned. Um, but I think as Africa, we need to be honest about one thing. When we, when we um, have meetings of this kind, we really neglect our disabled communities. And the reason why I'm saying this is if you look at use cases, um, and I, I, I won't even mention where, I'll actually give you the homework to do that yourselves, the potential of, use, uh, uh, of um, effectively using assistive technologies in your country um, has the uh, immense potential of one, not just obviously fighting equality and all the really good stuff that we all say we're here for, but actually injecting to your GDP. 
So I think with um, the leaders that are sitting here, that's one of the questions that I would like you to sort of research for yourself and ask yourself in the context of your, of your country, your communities, even your own hometown, what has been done from that perspective? That's the first one. The second one is more of a comment, I think, um, Honorable, just uh, uh, bootstrapping on what you said. You know, we're Africans and we've got our own norms, our own cultures. Um, there's, a, there's an English saying that says you can take a, a horse to water, uh, but you can't make a drink. We are Africans. If your brother, your cousin, your sister, your child, whoever cannot drink that water themselves, you make sure that water goes into that body. And I'd like to leave that as an actionable item for each one of us here to know that if, the, if, if whatever is required for us to achieve our goals from an IGF perspective as Africans is that water conundrum of water drinking horses, what, what? We make our horses drink in Africa. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to all of us. Uh, most of these have been comments. We are going to continue with these discussions going forward. I'll give now the floor to Lillian, who will attempt probably to answer some of the questions, but then also give uh, our vote of thanks. Okay, Magda, 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm counting. I, I think I, IGF, African IGF, is growing in the continent. As you, you have to know exactly what is a IGF. It is a multi-stakeholder multi forum. Uh, is the is is different to the WISIS forum, where uh, government come and make decision. Here it is just to discuss uh, on the key of the issue, key issue on the digital uh, technology around the world. It is very important to forum, one of the outcome of the WC25, and now I think everybody can discuss about issue related to Africa, to the world. We, you have seen several uh, opinions when we talk about artificial intelligence. People coming from the north have their own idea, but we have on, uh, our own idea on what's happened. In, in the continent because we know very well what's happened on this continent. And uh, we'll work with African Union to try uh, to make up more successful African IGF and to involve more government, more private sector, more civil society. I think you have seen uh, this uh, very good participation uh, in, uh, in Abuja. And I think next year we'll get uh, more uh, participants to the next African IGF. But in the meantime, we discuss between all key actors to see how we can make better African IGF functional in the benefits of the continent. Internet governance, the global one, we already have one last year in Ethiopia. It was very successful, but we can't organize it. Because the IGF will end in 2025. By 2025, it will not organize in Africa. Maybe if uh, the mandate is renewed by 2030, we can see is African country when when African country can uh, can organize. But it it is a competition to organize also this uh, internal governance forum. Thank you. Thank you, Magda. I realize we didn't give uh, Moses time to chance to answer any questions. So Moses, I give you one minute. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make a quick comment. I will not be, uh, I will be brief. Uh, one is on the uh, issue of initiatives on the continent. And I want to thank the distinguished uh, uh, speaker for raising it up. Uh, for information, uh, yes, uh, as part of uh, monitoring the implementation of the digital transformation strategy for Africa, we have put in an uh, institutional architecture and innovation framework where we, uh, uh, we have identified who is doing what to implement the digital uh, plan. And uh, as part of the monitoring evaluation framework, we have also appointed, uh, we, we requested member states and member states have nominated focal points for digital transformation. So we'll be quoting initiatives from member states, from all actors across the continent who are 
supporting us to implement the digital transformation strategy. And in 2025, uh, we we'll do a comprehensive. Um, the monitoring, of course, will be uh, uh, will be uh, annually, uh, but uh, as a midterm comprehensive evaluation, uh, we'll also do one in 2025. Regarding the strategy to grow uh, African IGF, I think uh, my colleague Makta uh, respect to that. Uh, you know, uh, strategies are always a consultative process. Uh, please, your inputs are also welcome, but we acknowledge we will continue one with the uh, uh, ECA and other stakeholders so that uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, grow, continue to grow the African e IGF. There is always room for improvement, uh, but uh, it be a consultative process involving everyone in spirit of uh, uh, the multi process. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. And uh, finally, we have run over time, but I'll ask Lillian to give our final remarks. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. It's only kind of ironic that I'm give, I have just one minute to you know, s say something, but it's also wonderful instead a good opportunity um, being the, the MAG chair for the Africa IGF to hear all these uh, kind of nice recommendations and you know, deliberations from, from the actors from the region, you know, very far, far away from, from our continent. Um, I think to me, um, when I was listening in, and part of the things that I was seeing coming out is a mass stakeholder approach, where we are seeing you know, some of the recommendations or some of the resolutions that we got from, from Abuja already happening, you know, the issue of uh, exercising political you know, um, power or to shape the digital you know, future for, for, for Africa. We already have the parliamentarian um, network. We had the Africa Parliamentarian Symposium. We had quite a number of ministers, you know, participating in the regional, in the continental forum. But also when we do a quick kind of, you know, lens, we zoom into the regional, uh, the sub-regional forums and the national forums, we are already seeing that governments are taking interest in these conversations. And so is, you know, private sector. So for me, I'm seeing that the multi-stakeholder multi um, multi approach is already there. So I think one of the recommendations that, um, uh, we got from the from from Abuja was to further strengthen that um, the role of the mag and uh, from Onika um, we've had the vision is there the plan is there when the Africa IGF was launched in 2021 uh, um, 20, 2011 oh God sorry 20, 2011 um, we started off you know with fewer countries participating but it has grown. And if we go back to the statistics that uh, were given from the host country, from the four days we had about 3,100 you know, people who registered. On site we had 1,414 participants and online we had 1,683. This is interest, you know, that people are interested in this, partners are in interested in this, and we have some of our key partners who have been you know, with us for the past years and they're still continuing to see that you know we are strengthening and growing our you know our continent and conversation so these are good things these are good um, things that we are seeing and we are hoping that um, like honorable mentioned that we we don't just stop at having conversations in choto or in abuja we need to be able to take the recommendations and take back whatever has been discussed and see how we can implement this at the regional and national level. So the vision we've had for Africa is there. Of course, there's, um, our role as the MAG is to see how can we strengthen the coordination of the forum, but also to increase participation of um, African stakeholders in the IG processes, whether it's a national, regional, or subcontinental level. So this is what we are working on and listening on to all the conversations that have come through. These are things that we are going to take on to see that next year is even bigger than Abuja. I'm glad that you know, Nigeria is already expressing you know, to, 
for us to go back there, but in the spirit of my stakeholderism, <laughs> we need to go to another country. <laughs> Unless, you know, all factors, you know, have been held constant and there's not any other host, then we can come back to Nigeria. Already we've had uh, conversations from, you know, interest from South Africa to host uh, from Benin. So there's already interest and we are seeing that the community is increasingly, you know, interested, you know, in hosting and, you know, taking these conversations to these countries. So through you, moderator, I would like to thank members, um, our partners at the global level, um, at the UN, uh, through the UN IGF Secretariat, uh, who have been able to join us today, uh, bring our, our conversations all the way from Abuja to Choto, to be able to listen on to the outcomes. But we also um, encourage you to continue supporting us to see how we can grow but also, you know, learn from what you're doing and help, um, not help, but partner with us in making the digital future for Africa more, um, more successful and more, you know, wonderful for, you know, for the development of the continent. Thank you. So thank you very much to our panelists, to our participants, and we look forward to working with you and making our next open forum to show out, output, outcome, and show how we have improved, as it has been said. Many thanks, and bye from all of us. Bye. Thank you very much. Apologies for the next session, so let's kindly move out, or we join them to listen to them. You didn't give me your time. Oh, I've sent you a message.